So when I was a child, my family belonged to a church that was big on sin. I mean, they were against it, but they were, they, they talked about it an awful lot. And I have to tell you, the adults in that church were not inclined to spare children from the awful consequences of sin. The message, if you're a kid, was pretty grim. Actually, it's grim if you're not a kid. It was that if I died without being forgiven by God, I would go to hell. And because God for, for, could forgive us, miserable, unworthy sinners that we were, we had to forgive others. And then, of course, we were taught Peter's question, the one you just heard, how many times do I have to forgive? And Peter thought, you know, maybe seven times, which I thought was a fairly generous number, actually. But no, Jesus said 70 times, or if you translate it differently, he said 70 times seven, and I don't even want to go there. Because in those days, I took that literally, 77 times. And I'm thinking, so should I carry around a little notepad and keep track of these sorts of things? Because trust me, when I got to 77 with Kathleen, who was really snarky and hurt my feelings, I was going to stop that forgiveness thing. <laughs> so yeah, I'm confessing here. I thought of forgiveness as a kind of weird, mostly unsolvable arithmetic problem. It was just something I couldn't quite comprehend. I get that you were supposed to forgive people, and you actually did that. It's just that they were really so serious about the sin part of it, I could never sort it out. And so now that I am clearly old and allegedly wise, what now? Well, now I'm still not sure that I completely comprehend, which is not a great way to start a sermon. But the more I think about it, the more I believe that any commitment to forgiveness should actually challenge us to the bottom of our souls. Let's start with the easy part. The sort of forgiveness that Christianity seems to most often advocate is a kind of ideal. It's sort of in the passage that you heard about people meeting together to work on forgiveness. <clears throat> it's straightforward. The offender shows remorse. The victim of a wrong lets go of their resentment, refuses to retaliate, refuses to dwell in anger, and then the path is open for dialogue, and eventually there is reconciliation. Sound about right? That's a lovely model, and we need it. We need to offer forgiveness, and we need to receive forgiveness simply because we live with other people and we offend and are offended more or less in equal measure. If there is love among us, and hence the desire for reconciliation, then even if apologies and forgiveness are difficult and sometimes they are really hard, we work at it. When Peter was asking that question, remember, <clears throat> he asked how many times he should, he should forgive his brother or his sister. He was talking about loving relationships. In close relationships, which I include communities of faith, it's never forgiving for seven times or 77 times. The forgiveness is never ending and love will flourish. And if that doesn't happen, if resentments are kept festering and non-forgiveness has run amok, then we should know that it's time that we take a hard look at ourselves and do our utmost <clears throat> to repair our relationships because they need mending. That's the easy part. Here's where it gets messy. The love, the love, this lovely model hides a great potential for abuse. In fact, there have been way too many cases when the church, and we'll talk about the church today, in particular, <clears throat> has weaponized this version of forgiveness to preserve the status quo. In effect, to deny the genuine pain of victims so that everything will seem okay. Mitchell Atencio, who's a writer for Sojourners, notes his dissatisfaction with this model. 
Defining forgiveness, he writes, as moving past and forgetting harm is vague and hard to fathom at times. I have repeatedly seen the powerful, wep the powerful weaponize the instruction to forgive against the oppressed, against the abused. Black people told to forgive the U.S. for chattel slavery. <clears throat> Women told to forgive husbands who abused them. Survivors of sexual violence, of priests and ministers told to forgive the church. Surely this was not the forgiveness that Jesus instructed. And then Mitchell added that he still believes that forgive is a command for Christians to follow. But how? Sometimes it seems impossible. I know that many people probably more than a few of us, have had to confront circumstances where our hearts have put forgiveness on hold. You just heard Brandy tell that story of Eva. Of course she put forgiveness on hold. There's so many other circumstances. At one point, I wrote this paragraph and it went on for two pages. Let me, just a few examples. A beloved child killed by a drunk driver. The uncle who molested our sister or brother or us and never was confronted for the sake of family peace. A child abused and abused, ultimately abandoned by a parent. A trans child sub subjected to a constant stream of abuse until the child retreats from the world or worse, commits suicide. The sibling traumatized by a rape from a stranger that law enforcement never finds or finds and then by casting vile aspersions on the victim gets off. I could go on and on. The hatred circulating in our world, the accompanying violence, the willingness of too many to act out hatred or really just act out their complete indifference to other lives. And frankly, there is the appalling willingness of too many to just turn their heads when these abuses occur because they just don't want to deal with conflict. All of this challenges us as we ask ourselves as Christians what forgiveness means, what it looks like, how you practice it. And so I'm going to ask you today, to join with me in pondering a particular difficult case. There's a jillion I could have chosen. Here's one. On June the 17th, 2015, a young white man walked into the historic beloved black church in Charleston, South Carolina, Emmanuel African ME Church more commonly known as Mother Emmanuel. He joined 13 others, all of them black, for the Wednesday night Bible class. He sat next to the pastor, Clementa Pickney. He listened for a while. He bickered with them a bit over a Bible interpretation. He stayed for an hour. And then at the very end, as the group stood up to bow their heads in a closing prayer, this young man also stood up, pulled out a concealed handgun, and started shooting. He killed nine of the group, including Pastor Pinckney. Dylan Roof was arrested a day later. He had no remorse. He was a committed white supremacist. He did, he said, what had to be done. And even at his sentencing a year later, he remained completely unrepentant. But that's not what I want to talk about. At his arraignment, not long after he was captured, actually, this crazy thing happened, astonishing thing happened. Several of the victim's family members spoke to him through a closed circuit television feed to his jail. Nadine Collier, who lost her mother, said through her tears, you took something very precious from me. I will never talk to her again. I will never 
ever hold her again. But I forgive you. Bethane Middleton Brown, whose sister was slain, said to Ruth, I acknowledge that I am very angry, but we have no room for hating, so we have to forgive. I pray God on your soul. Wanda Simons, the granddaughter of yet another victim, spoke directly and said to Ruth, although my grandfather and other victims died at the hands of hate, this is proof Everyone's plea for your soul is proof that they lived in love and their legacies will be love, so hate won't win. This outpouring of forgiveness was extraordinary. And as it should have been, it was wildly, widely lauded. President Obama said that the words of these survivors were an expression of faith that is unimaginable. Yes, they were. Remember, they offered this forgiveness just days after the massacre. It was so shocking that some skeptics simply said, is that real? Could this be really forgiveness at this point? And maybe we think that too. Maybe we say, how could that be real? This avowed and completely unrepentant white supremacist had just murdered their loved ones, and so how was any sort of forgiveness possible? And for that matter, how there, could there ever be forgiveness without justice? It hadn't yet been served, had it? For the record, I think that these extraordinary expressions of forgiveness were quite, quite real. But I also think that the grieving members of Mother Emanuel introduced us to a much more complex understanding of forgiveness, an understanding way beyond that simple model we usually use. When these survivors spoke to Ruth, there was absolutely no thought of reconciliation. There will be no reconciliation. Although, I have to say, if a miracle happens, and Dylan Roof genuinely print, repents and offers his contrition to Mother Emanuel, I believe they will accept it. In addition, most importantly, they firmly rejected any hatred directed at Roof. Yes, yes, there was anger, not hatred. Essentially, they stood together and offered this version of forgiveness. They refused to retaliate in the most obvious way they could. They refused to hate Dylan Roof. And then they freed themselves from him. Ah, you say, but can there be true forgiveness without justice? Well, I don't know. Roof received the death penalty in federal court, a life sentence without parole in state court, he is still on death row at this moment. But here's the funny thing about criminal justice in our country. It is justice that is only about punishment, which is essentially retaliation put into the hands of the state. You did something wrong, therefore we will punish you. And Ruff was sentenced to the ultimate punishment. I'm certainly not arguing that Dylan Ruff should ever walk the streets of America as a free man, but I will argue that the answer to the question, can there ever be forgiveness without justice, is that actually those are two very different things, at least given the way we define justice. Consider this. The Reverend Anthony Thompson, whose wife was killed that night, was one of the ones who offered forgiveness on that day. But later he also said this, if they give Ruff the death penalty, I'm not going to interfere. As far as I'm concerned, he doesn't exist anymore. This is going to be with us for the rest of our life, but Dylan Ruff has no place in that. 
is it, it, it was as if he said he would turn his back on the justice part and simply live into the forgiveness part. I want to parse those words just a bit. What is this this that will be with them for the rest of their lives? What is the that in which Dylan Roof has no place? Well, isn't it obvious? And isn't it odd that we so seldom really examine it? That this is, of course, the grief, the gut-wrenching grief, the heart-wrenching anguish at their loss. And their forgiveness and their lamentation are, in the end, more honest than any retaliation offered by justice because it recognizes what justice refuses to see. If Dylan Roof is executed, or if he just spends the rest of his days in prison, what he did cannot be undone. Those nine beloved members of Mother Emmanuel will still be dead. There is no answer for that but mourning, lamentation, and forgiveness utterly intertwined. And where does that leave us? Well, it certainly doesn't leave us with a math of forgiveness, as my silly title says. There isn't a tidy algorithm to show us how to do it. In our role as Christians, as citizens of a community, of society writ large, it seems to me that our first task is to stand in solidarity with those who mourn, those who struggle with unspeakable loss, those who are trying to forgive instead of hate. We must join in that lamentation, all those lamentations. We must refuse to ignore their pain. We refuse to try to silence their anguish so that we can all pretend that everything is just okay now. And then, I'll tell you the truth, I think we ask for forgiveness. We ask forgiveness for all the times we have turned away from the pain and the anguish of others and have neglected to join in the lamentation that really should be a constant in our life. Let me put it this way. We can applaud the conviction of Dylan Roof, but we must not miss the real point. The members of Mother Emanuel are no safer from the vileness of white supremacy than they were before he was arrested. We can mourn the loss of a transgender child, but the war against our transgender brothers and sisters continues unabated. We can be appalled at the death of, of a woman at the hands of her husband, but the sheer omnipresence of domestic violence does nothing but grow. In effect, I'm saying we ask forgiveness for all that we have left undone and continue to leave undone all the work we must do as followers of Christ, as we promise to do as followers of Christ. We must ask for strength while we work in any and every way we can to spread the balm of God's love and God's justice, the justice that isn't about retaliation and punishment, but rather about healing and peace. Yes, we really do need God's forgiveness. And here's the good part. We have it. I do know now that my childhood Sunday school teachers had it all wrong, praise be. They painted a picture of a God who offered a sort of grudging tolerance for us. They said God is love, but actually he seemed really grumpy, parceling out little bits of forgiveness if we were all good girls and boys. Nope. The good news is far different, way more grand. God doesn't just offer mercy. God is mercy itself. As Thomas Merton said, mercy upon mercy upon mercy love itself. We are forever loved, always forgiven, even when we fail again and again as we will. 
And thanks be to God for that abundant grace. Amen.